Hengist Brehead is a surprising place, an area of outstanding scientific interest and great natural beauty. Lying just east of Bournemouth on the Dorset coast, it's a promontory that juts into the Solent. The headland, nearly two kilometres in length and barely half a kilometre wide at its narrowest, divides the open sea from the more tranquil waters of Christchurch Harbour, into which flow the rivers Avon and Stour. Given its prominent position in the landscape, it's not hard to imagine why Hengistbury played such an important role in this area during the prehistoric period. For not only does it display a remarkable wealth of archaeological remains, but it's also one of the very few places in Britain that has an almost unbroken record of human activity throughout prehistory, from the Stone Age to the Iron Age. The most obvious remains are several Bronze Age burial mounds, or barrows, and the Iron Age defensive earthworks known as the Double Dykes. The site is owned by Bournemouth Borough Council and is a public open space, managed as a nature reserve and protected as a scheduled ancient monument. Bournemouth deserves warm praise for its attempts to allow visitors to enjoy the site while still maintaining the quality of the natural environment. Hengisbury first appears to have been used intensively as a sort of residential campsite towards the end of the last ice age, about 12,500 years ago. This campsite the evidence for which appeared at the cliff edge above the Long Groin is of international importance. The next evidence for occupation comes after the end of the last ice age, during the Mesolithic period, about 9,700 years ago. The headland was now exploited by Middle Stone Age hunter-gatherers, whose campsite is located east of the Coast Guard building. Excavations of the hunter-gatherer campsites were undertaken in the 1980s. These were rescue digs on the cliff edge to retrieve the remaining archaeology before it was lost to sea erosion. The excavations were directed by Professor Nick Barton. Well, remember, at the end of the last ice age, this is a period that's sometimes referred to as the late glacial, although temperatures were actually rising and rising quite rapidly, we're still um, we're still looking at a period where sea levels were greatly reduced, global sea levels, as a result of um, water trapped in glacial ice. And there was a land bridge between Britain and the continent um, at this time at the end of the Ice Age. I think to begin with we can envisage a fairly open landscape that was only beginning to be reforested fairly slowly. So we'd be looking at um, a, a landscape dotted with a few trees like birch and pine. And this is the kind of landscape that the first hunter-gatherers at Hengistbury, the Upper Paleolithic hunters, would be moving into. Um, this would be a landscape dominated, as I said, by relatively open conditions, and the kind of animals that you'd expect in this period would be um, maybe more open plain types, like the, the wild uh, horse, maybe red deer, um, and perhaps later aurochs. And these would be the prime prey animals available to the late glacial hunters. Now all this changed um, at the beginning of the, the post-glacial period, all this changed and when we have a more woodland setting uh, this would have been occupied by a different range of animals, um, perhaps including more of the, uh, the wild aurochs, the wild cattle, um, animals again like red deer, perhaps roe deer and so forth. And this was a slightly different landscape setting for the Mesolithic hunters, the people who arrived or who were living in the area at a later time than these late glacial hunter-gatherers. So what does the campsite consist of? Well, there are the remains of many, many visits to the headland. Certainly early on, at the end of the last ice age, um, we'd be looking at people who were moving across the landscape, moving perhaps up river valleys, um, people who originally had come over from places like France, perhaps the Somme Valley area, the Paris Basin, but were now firmly settled in Britain and had territories probably around Hengistbury Head. The rise in sea level that separated Britain from the continent about 7,000 years ago created a local landscape much as we see it today. Hengistbury was an attractive place to live. The sea, estuary, rivers, forests and reed beds provided food, water, building materials and farmland. 
settlements of some of the earliest farming communities of the Neolithic, or New Stone Age, about 5,500 years ago, left evidence in the form of scatters of flint tools and fragments of decorated grooved ware pottery, but no buildings. In the Bronze Age, about 3,500 years ago, the headland became an important round barrow cemetery. The Wessex Bowl Barrow was the burial site of a 25-year-old woman of considerable local importance. She was buried with a large decorated pottery urn, a small highly decorated incense cup, three amber beads, two small gold cones, and a pendant in the form of a miniature weapon with a copper blade set in an amber handle. Uh, when we move into uh, the second millennium BC, what, what is traditionally the Bronze Age, um, then on the, the main ridge of the, the headland, they were using it for their burial monuments. And we've got lots of barrows strung up from the highest part right down to beyond the, the, the double ditches. Whether people were using that landscape or isolating it for burial is, is a debatable point. My own view is that um, they would have had a zone where the burials were, but they would have been using the land around. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if we found um, evidence of uh, Bronze Age settlements of this date on the lower lying land, uh, particularly around the fringes of the harbour. It's just this last bit here yeah. okay. where you're, you're yeah. pulling, pulling across it. In 2002, Phil Harding excavated trenches on the site of a proposed development on the former pitch and putt course. These revealed some remarkable discoveries. A Bronze Age ring ditch, perhaps the remains of a burial mound, and a cremation urn containing burnt crab apples, only the second time that this fruit has been found in Bronze Age Europe. Here also were pits, post holes and pottery, the first evidence of Iron Age activity outside the Double Dykes earthwork. Apart from anything else, we've come up with some really, really exciting archaeology. I mean, we knew that there was Iron Age occupation and prehistoric occupation over there on the head, and we knew that the potential for finding more of it over here was good. What we've actually done is confirm that potential. There is loads of really good Iron Age and Bronze Age archaeology in this part of the head. Hengisbury is a site of international importance for its Iron Age archaeology. About 2,500 years ago, in the early to middle Iron Age, Britons inhabited roundhouses in a settlement along the south shore of Christchurch Harbour, beside a small bay known as Barn Bight. The inhabitants used nearby iron stones to smelt iron and local clay to make coarse handmade pottery. They could have paddled log boats inland along the rivers Avon and Stour, trading iron for grain. Evidence of an early defensive ditch and bank can be seen in the low cliff on the seaside of the headland. Our picture of Hengisbury, I think, must be one of people continuously using it from way back in time, um, throughout the Bronze Age, into what we conventionally call the Iron Age. The same, same people coming and going from the site, using it in a variety of ways. Uh, the difference being that by about the 6th century, this new technology of iron manufacture had begun to be picked up in Britain, certainly in, in southern Britain, uh, and those who were at Hengisbury would have realised that they had very good supplies of iron, so they would start adopting the new technology. We don't need to think of new people coming in, it's the same people developing new ideas. A few years ago, people would have talked about Celts coming to Britain from the continent and uh, setting up their settlements in Britain. But uh, nowadays, archaeologists move very, very fast. 
And we no longer believe that there were great migrations of people swamping into the country, setting up our Iron Age. Uh, what we really think now is that the inhabitants of places like Black Hengisbury and, and the landscape around are simply the people who've always been there, whose inhabitants go right back in time, back probably as far as the Mesolithic period. So it's quite wrong now, I think, to talk about Celts in Britain. We can talk about Celts on the continent, where the Roman writers talk about Celts, but no Roman writer ever used the word about the inhabitants of Britain. When they wrote about them, they always called them Britons, and that, I think, is what we ought to do. The sort of picture we should have, I think, of, of Britain at this time, particularly southern Britain, is of people uh, very much in contact with what was going on on the continent. They were not isolated at all. Experimental archaeology has taught us much about the past. Archaeologists take the evidence collected from excavations and then by carrying out experiments like building boats and making and using pots and tools, they test out their ideas. As a result, we now have a whole new dimension to our understanding of the past. Butser Ancient Farm in Hampshire, founded by the late Dr Peter Reynolds, is an open-air laboratory for research into British Iron Age agriculture and building techniques. Experts in ancient technology have contributed much to our understanding of life in the Iron Age, by making replicas of buildings and boats, smelting iron ore, weaving cloth, preparing and cooking food, making tools, and even slinging shot. About 2,000 years ago, in the late Iron Age, Hengisbury was fortified and served as a port for international trade. The site was well situated, with a harbour and access by river to the heart of densely populated Wessex. Evidence for harbour works was found at Rushy Peace on the shore of Christchurch Harbour. Seagoing, shallow draught, oak planked boats with a square leather or canvas sail undertook hazardous voyages across the channel without the aid of a compass. The local region around Hengistbury produced iron, salt and Kimridge shale for making bracelets, while the Wessex Chalkland offered surpluses of grain and wool. Excavations have provided evidence of trading links with southwestern Britain, where lead and metal ores of copper, silver and probably tin were acquired. Luxury goods shipped in from across the English Channel in addition to amphorae full of wine and pottery from Brittany, included bronze tableware, ingots of purple and yellow glass, and figs. From Hengisbury Head, it's likely that the Britons exported grain, cattle, gold, silver and iron, together with hides, slaves and hunting dogs. In charge of excavations of the Iron Age archaeology at Hengistbury Head in the 1980s was Professor Barry Cunliffe. By the first century BC, things were changing quite rapidly, uh, not only at Hengistbury, but uh, across, across Europe, because um, Rome was beginning to make itself felt. The needs of Rome for raw materials and manpower were beginning to change the societies all the way around. So that what were... Um, gentle trading networks before, going back hundreds, possibly even thousands of years, suddenly uh, become energised and um, more commodities are passing um, from one part of the um, barbarian world to another, to another, to another, and eventually uh, to the Roman world. Now we mustn't begin to think of Roman traders sort of sailing up to Hengisbury. Um, and trying to sell their amphorae to the benighted natives. It's nothing like that at all. Uh, these Roman amphorae and the Roman luxury goods would have been passed from A to B, and then B to C, and then C to D. And the last bit of that trade, uh, those amphorae would have been brought to Brittany, 
and would have gone into the hands of Breton traders. And it was the Breton traders from ports on the north coast of Brittany uh, that were making the last leg of the journey. So quite a lot of activity going on. And then the whole thing, I think, defined by the great double dikes, the, um, the banks and ditches, which uh, are such an obvious part of the promontory today, cutting it off from, from the mainland. Um, we don't know much about these double dikes. They probably go back to the Middle Iron Age, to the, the period before this intensive trade. But they would have been very important as the sort of the marker of the territory within which trade was possible. Uh, distinguishing it from the rest of the land. And we get this, this kind of pattern in, in many places uh, in the ancient world that special land is set aside for trade and exchange. And it's almost, uh, sacred would be the wrong word, but it's sacrosanct to the extent that uh, foreigners can come there and they are safe, and you are safe with them. Um, but they mustn't go beyond. So I think the uh, the boundary of the double dikes is, is very much um, the boundary of safety for the foreigners who are coming from, from Brittany and elsewhere to trade with the locals. The Iron Age port thrived for about 50 years and then quickly declined after Caesar conquered France and Belgium and established new trading routes along the rivers Seine and Rhine. The ports of Rotterdam and La Havre then linked up with the nearer ports of South East England Hengistbury continued in use and became one of the major settlements of the local tribe known as the Girotridiers. These folk made wheel-turned pots and minted coins. After the Roman invasion in AD 43, this small town declined. For about 300 years during the Roman occupation, it continued as a small farming village. Hengistbury Head has not been occupied on a similar scale since those times. Despite the archaeological riches that are already known from Hengistbury, much remains to be discovered on this vulnerable headland, where the forces of nature, rising sea levels and visitor pressure continue to be a real threat. Hengistbury Head is a unique and remarkable place and provides a link to some of our most ancient ancestors. Hengistbury Head is a treasure that deserves our protection.